الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد Today Friday the 21st of the Qada 1434 corresponding to the 27th of September 2013 we commence with the 6th lesson of the book at the Sheikh Al Alama, the Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdullah Ibn Baz Rahmanullah Ta'ala. A number of Hujaj, uh, they have requested that you finish up answering the question about visiting the Prophet's grave after the name of Allah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa shahadu an la ilaha ibn Allah, wa liyu salikin. Wa shahadu anna Muhammadan abduhu. ورسوله بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد question about visiting the grave of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I believe you're talking about the one when someone asked to visit after every salah to back up because it's important for us to understand some introductory matters when we talk about visiting the grave of the Prophet The first thing is that in the beginning of Islam, in the beginning of the Sharia of Muhammad وسلم, visiting the graves was something that was impermissible, it was prohibited for the Muslims to do across the board. No grave was allowed to be visited, whether that was the grave of a prophet, a pious person, or a companion that had passed or anything. The Prophet ﷺ had prohibited this. And the reason why visiting the graves in the beginning was prohibited was because the teachings of Islam and the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that He is alone the one that has the ability to benefit someone or to harm someone or to provide for them. This concept was something that had to be ingrained in the people because as you know when the Prophet was sent to them they were mushriku. They were idolaters and they believed that the statues or the images that they worshipped had the ability to bring them some harm or some benefit. And though these things were a wasita or an intermediary between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in every deen, not just the deen of the mushrikeen, but in every deen that exists, People have beliefs about the relationship between them and those who have died. And they have certain rituals and these type of things. And some of them believe up until today, from amongst the famous religions on earth, that the dead have the ability to protect them, or have the ability to look over them, or have the ability to be intermediaries between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God or whatever they may call him, creator of the heavens and earth. And that belief is ingrained in people to the point that till today when someone's relative dies from a particular religion for example, they feel that that person is like an angel watching over them. And so there's this belief about what happens after death that controls what a person does and how they behave and how they believe. And so the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited the Muslims in the beginning from visiting the graves to cut off any of that type of belief so that their heart would be attached to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala alone. Once that became established and the Dawah of Islam became firm in the hearts of the believers, then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Kuntu 
تُذَكِّرُ بِالْآخِرَةِ I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves, but now visit them because they remind you of the hereafter. And so the legislated visiting of the graves is that which is done to remind the visitor of the hereafter and so that he can make dua for the one who has returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet sallallahu himself used to do when he would go to the baqiyah and he would say assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyari min al-mu'minina wal-muslimin antum lana sabiqoon wa nahnu bikum lahiqoon نسأل الله إن شاء الله نسأل الله لنا ولكم العافية. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that there are different versions of this hadith, but he would give salams to those who have been buried from amongst the Muslims and amongst the believers. And he would say that you have preceded us and we will follow you إن شاء الله. We ask Allah, and this is the point here. He would make dua for them. We ask Allah for you and us that He pardon us and that He forgive us. So this was, this is the type of visiting the graves that is legislated in Islam. And if it is legislated to visit the graves in general, then visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more so is legislated. So it is legislated to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned this Ummah from doing what the previous nations had done. And he said, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ اِتَّخَدُ قُبُورَ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ مَسَاجِدٍ May Allah's curse be upon the Jews and the Christians. And you just heard the Imam recite the ayah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy for all of the alami, everything, all of the creation. That merciful one said, may the curse of Allah be upon the Jews and the Christians, those who have taken the graves of their prophets as masajid. It's places of worship. What is a masjid? It's a place where the people gather to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So though it is legislated to visit the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not legislated to visit it after every salah. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تتخذوا بيوتكم قبورا Do not take your houses or لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا Don't make your houses like graves. What, what happens in the grave? Nothing. There is no ibadah that goes on in the grave. There is no dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that point, there's only being, you know, being held accountable. There is no worship at that particular time. So don't make your houses like the graves. In other words, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your houses. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa informed us that the best salah of a man is in his house except for the obligatory salah. And make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your homes, the house in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned is a house that is alive. And the example of the house in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not mentioned is like a house that is dead. So do not make your houses like graves. And do not take my grave as an Eid. An Eid is something that you're tadu. That is something that habitually one intends to go to or celebrate ritually. So don't take the grave as a place where you go, for example, every day after Asr, or every Friday, or every month, or any specific time. Don't take the Prophet's grave as an Eid. The Prophet prohibited us from that. Out of love, some people say, but out of love, I want to visit. If you love him, then follow him. Don't disobey him. The Prophet was the one that told us, don't take his grave as a place of an Eid. It's a place where one habitually goes. And then he said, And send the Salat upon me because your Salat will reach me wherever you may be. Wherever you may be. So if a person wants to visit the grave of the Prophet there is no harm. In, that. in fact, this is something legislated. And a person
person who goes there, there are certain etiquettes that he needs to keep in mind. The first thing is that when he goes, he should be careful not to harm the rest of the Muslims. Because harming the Muslims is haram. Impermissible to harm the Muslims. And as many of you know, if you've tried to go in these days of Hajj, or Hajj time, when you try to go to the grave of the Prophet is very crowded, people are pushing one another, and perhaps one may do something that is impermissible. So be careful. Go to the grave of the Prophet with tranquility, number one. The second thing is when you do get to the grave of the Prophet face the grave, do not face the Qibla. And say, Assalamu alaikum, ayyuha rasul, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Give the salams to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he said, that there is no one that gives me salams except that Allah returns my soul to me and then I return the salams to him. This is collected by Abu Dawood. So, give the salams to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and send the salat upon him. And the best of those forms is the Salah, what is known as the Salah al-Ibrahimi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama sallita ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim, innaka hamidun mujeed, Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim, innaka hamidun mujeed. And that is sufficient. If you want to add something to that, by saying, I bear witness that you are the Messenger of Allah, and that you conveyed the message, and that you were sincere to this ummah, or something like this, something to that effect, then there is no harm in doing so. However, one should not stand there for a very long time. In Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that this was disliked, to stand at the grave for a long period of time, the grave of the Prophet, Then a person moves slightly to the right, and he gives salams to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Assalamu alaikum ya Siddiq al-Ummah or whatever one wants to say Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then likewise the same with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and this is what the son of Umar Ibn Umar Abdullah Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu ma used to do he would go uh, when returning from a travel or traveling outside of Medina and then returning he would go to the grave of the Prophet and give him salams. And he would give salams to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And he would give salams to his father. And he would not add anything. He would just say, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Bakr wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ya Abati wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And that would be all that Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Huma would say. Likewise, one should not raise his voice at the grave of the Prophet وسلم, or do any other thing, not make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal while he is there. Uh, it is better for one to make dua and sujood. This is not a place where a person should go to make dua. In fact, Ali ibn Hussein, Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet وسلم, his son, Ali ibn Hussein, is reported to have seen a man who used to go, there was a space close to the grave of the Prophet وسلم, and he would go to that space and he would make dua there, not to the Prophet وسلم, he would make dua to Allah, but at that particular place. And Ali ibn al-Husayn rahimahullah ta'ala told him, do not do that, do not go there and make dua because verily I heard my father tell me that his father told him that the Prophet وسلم, say, said, لا تتخذوا بيوتكم قبورا ولا تتخذوا قبري عيدا Do not take, make your homes like the graves and do not take my قبر, uh, my uh, grave as a place of worship as an Eid, a place where one habitually uh, goes to So in any event, it is not legislative nor is it the Sunnah, nor is it permissible due to the prohibition of the Prophet وسلم, for one to go to the grave after every salah. Nor is it permissible for one to make a specific time of the week or of the day where he goes every day or every week to visit the grave of the Prophet And yes, there are some who will say that there are scholars, however, from the 6th century, the 7th, the 8th century, who said that 
it is permissible for one to travel so he can visit the grave of the Prophet like son, and he should do A, B, and C and say D, E, and F. But the reality of the matter is that we don't need, we don't, and, and not in an arrogant way, but we don't need the statements of scholars from the latter times when we already have the practice of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Tabi'een, and those who followed them. There is no one that has been guaranteed isma or perfection and infallibility after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there is no one that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has mentioned specifically that he is pleased with them except for the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then those who followed them with ihsan. Yani to the best of their ability they followed them imperfectly. And so in this instance we have the example of the companions. They did not go to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they had some issues between themselves at times. And, and I'm saying this because, subhanAllah, I've seen myself, not something that I need to narrate on anyone else, I've seen myself papers that people send to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Messenger of Allah, I have been married for 10 years and I have not been able to have a child. Please ask Allah to grant me a child. This is something I read with my own eyes. This is coming from the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where people have this belief that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was unlettered by the way, he didn't read in his lifetime. They send him messages that they want him to read to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is a door that is going to lead to calling upon other than Allah Azza Wa Jalla. These are means to calling upon and making dua to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not something that is from the deen of Islam whatsoever. And so we can't use the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yani that type of visiting where a person begins to over glorify the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the type of glorification that is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Sheikh Rahmanullah says, Women are allowed to assume ihram in anything they want. It can be black, green, or any other color. However, they should be careful to not imitate men in clothing. It is impermissible for her to wear niqab and gloves while in the state of ihram. But she still has to cover her face and hands, which can, which can be done without wearing a niqab and gloves. And that is because the Prophet sallallahu prohibited women who are in the state of ihram wearing niqab and gloves. Yeah, Khwani, uh, we made it in the last lesson. We talked about what a person does when he gets to the miqat. So we're going to go over that quickly so that it can bring us up to speed with what the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, is talking about here. So we mentioned that when a person gets to the miqat, he is to make a ghusl. Okay? And this is the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Likewise, he applies scent to his body, not to the ihram, but to his body, his beard, his hair, under his arms and the like. He is also going to remove al-makhid. And for those who were present, what is al-makhid? Huh? Stitched clothes. What, is the, what are stitched clothes? Any clothes that have stitching in them? Huh? Again? The kameez? Like there were a number of things, not just the kameez, not. Nah. Right, Any, anything tailored to the body, the normal clothes. So the muhrim, once he gets, or once the person who is intending to go into ihram gets to the miqat, then he must remove all of those, uh, all of his makhid, okay, all of those clothes that the Prophet Sallallahu talked about, which are normal tailored clothes to the body, he must remove them before entering the state of Ihram. Tayyip, a woman who is on her menses, what does she do when she gets to the Miqat? Two things we talked about. The first is that she makes a ghusl like everyone else. And the second thing is that she enters into the state of Ihram. And this is critical to note because many women believe that because they're on their menses, they just go 
to Mecca, and then when they're off, then they're going to assume ihram. No, you, the woman who is on her menses also assumes ihram from the miqat, just like everyone else. Likewise, we talked about the issue of removing any unwanted hair from the body under the arms and the pubic area, the mustache, that this is to be removed at that particular time, even though this has nothing to do with ihram itself, but it has everything to do with the general etiquette that a Muslim is supposed to follow by removing that hair at least once every 40 days, and if a person needs to do so more often, then he should do so. So we get to the point now where we talk about what the woman wears when she goes into ihram. And the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, mentioned that a woman can wear black, she can wear green, she can wear any color, that she likes. There's no specific color that a woman must wear when entering Ihram. No specific color whatsoever. She can wear whatever she likes, but she should be careful not to resemble the men in the dress that she wears. Because the Prophet ﷺ prohibited women from imitating men and men from imitating women. And he mentioned that the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon the men who imitate women and women who imitate men. The only thing that the author mentions, rahimahullah ta'ala, that a woman must avoid in terms of clothing, garment, when in the state of ihram, is that she cannot wear niqab, nor can she wear gloves. A niqab is the fixture that is made for the face, tied over the face, and has a very small opening for the eyes, so that the woman can see. What many women wear today, where this much sticks out, this is not niqab, that's lithan. It's not considered niqab. The niqab is much smaller. Only the eyes can be seen. As for showing part of the nose and the forehead and the the eyebrows and the likes, this is not something that was known amongst the women at the time of the Prophet However, affixing, affixing anything to the face takes the same ruling as the niqab. A woman is not to affix anything to her face. Nor is she to wear gloves. Because the Prophet said in Hadith Sahih Bukhari, لا تنتقب المرأة المحرمة ولا تلبس القفازين the muhrimah, the woman who is in the state of ihram, is not to wear niqab, nor is she to wear the gloves. However, as the author rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, she still covers her face as the wives of the Prophet sallallahu did. And that was using their khimar. Okay, so what they would use to cover their heads, they would then drape over their faces in the presence of men who were not mahram for them. And I hope this is clear because some people believe that because the Prophet وسلم, prohibited the woman from wearing niqab in ihram, that she is not to cover her face in ihram. And that is a gross misunderstanding. Because the Prophet وسلم, also prohibited men from wearing pants, correct? Did he prohibit the men from covering the area that pants normally covers? No. But you are not to wear pants. So you wear an izam. Likewise, a woman is not to affix anything to her face. That does not mean that she doesn't cover her face. Rather, she covers her face with something that is uh, already on her head. And the women, they know how to do this. It's basically a matter of pulling on the top part down so that it drapes over. And likewise, covering the hands is very easy because one can simply stick them into the garment if necessary, if necessary. So again, the woman may wear anything that she wants to wear. However, she is not to wear a niqab nor gloves. Now, what about wearing socks for men? A oh, women should wear socks. No socks. Yes. Okay. Yes. Women, not men. 
Some Muslims believe that women, while in a haram, must wear black or green. This is not correct, as there is no proof for this at all. After the pilgrim finishes read, read that again. Some Muslims believe that women, while in a haram, must wear black or green. And some believe that the women, not only black or green, some believe that the women need to wear white when in a haram. But there is no basis for this in Islam. This is not correct as there is no proof for this at all. After the pilgrim finishes taking a shower, cleaning himself, removing unwanted hair and nails, and putting on clothes of the Quran, he then intends to enter the ranks he wants to perform. The author is going on to inform us. What else, what else does the muhrim do after assuming ihram? Okay, so we have taking a ghusl, and we have removing, uh, putting on, applying scent, we have uh, the removal of any unwanted hair. All of these things we have. And we talked about the women. Once this takes place, what is the muhrim supposed to do? Because now we want to go to Mecca. And we want to assume ihram. So what does the muhrim do now? He then intends to enter the rites. He then he then intends to enter the right he wants to perform, whether that be Hajj or Umrah. The proof for this is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّمْ لِئِمَّا نَوَى Actions are but by intentions, and every man shall have only that which he intended. It is legislated for the pilgrim to verbalize what he is in, intended. Therefore, if his intention is to do Umrah, he says, لَبَيْكَ Umrah, or Allahumma لَبَيْكَ Umrah. Allahumma labbayk Umrah. If his intention is Hajj, he says, labbayk Hajjim, labbayk Allahumma Hajjim. This is based on the action of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he did this. Tayyip. Here, the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says that once a person has now prepared himself to enter into the state of Ihram, he is now going to pronounce the type of right that he is going to perform. He is now going to pronounce the right that he is going to perform. And as the author is going to mention uh, in the upcoming classes, inshallah ta'ala, there are three different types of rights that one can perform for, for one who is attending hajj. That is, Hajj al tamattur and Hajj al qiran and Hajj al ifrad Hajj al tamattur simply means that a person is going to perform Umrah first, come out of Ihram and then go back into Ihram on the eighth day for Hajj. Hajj al qiran means that he is performing Hajj and Umrah at the same time, meaning that they have been combined with one another. Hence the word qiran or qarana which means to, to combine. In this sense, Hajj al Ifrad means he's performing Hajj by itself without an Umrah, and that the differences between these rites are going to come in Shalom time. So the person has an intention in his heart, as the Prophet said, that actions are but by intentions. And the place for those intentions is in the heart. But the person is going to verbally pronounce the type of right that he is going to perform. As the Prophet وسلم, did when he was at the Hulayfa. Anas ibn Malik عنه, says that he heard the Prophet وسلم, say, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهِ لَبَيْكَ حَجَّةً وَعُمْرًا أو لَبَيْكَ عُمْرَةً وَحَجَّةً That this is what the Prophet وسلم, says. So he verbalized the intention that he had. Now, this is based on the action of the Prophet وسلم, as he did this. The best time to state this is when he gets on the bus or into his vehicle. This is because the Prophet وسلم, did this after he mounted his camel and started to move. This is the most correct opinion in this regard. Tight. So here, when does a person verbalize the intention for 
Roma or Hajj, depending on what he's performing. Does he perform it, in, for example, here at, in Medina, all of you who are going to make Umrah or Hajj from Medina are going to go to Dhul Hulayfa. Okay? Once at Dhul Hulayfa, what does the person do? Does he make the intention inside the masjid that has been built there at Dhul Hulayfa? No. Perform the Umrah. 
And this is sufficient. This is where the intention is. The intention is in the heart. What the Prophet verbalized was not his intention. He verbalized or pronounced the rights that he was performing. Not the intention itself. So this is why the Prophet did not say, I intend to make Hajj. Or I intend to make Umrah. Or I intend to make Hajj. Together. This is not something that the Prophet did. Rather, the Prophet simply said, Labbaika, Umratan wa Hajja. Oh Allah, here I am to perform the Hajj and the Umrah. As for anything else, whether it is Salah, or Tawaf, or Sa'i, or anything, it is not legislated that the Muslim verbalize his intention by saying, Oh Allah, I intend to pray this many rakats at this particular place. Or, Oh Allah, I intend to go around your house seven times. This is not something that has been legislated by the Prophet nor is it something that the companions of the Messenger والسلام, did, nor is it something that is known that the Tabi'i did, and likewise. So, in this situation, what was the Prophet والسلام, actually verbalizing? He was pronouncing the rites that he was going to perform. And there are three things that one says when entering the state of Ihram. The first thing is to pronounce the right that one is performing. So you're going to say, Labbaik Allahumma. For everyone who's making tamantur, then you just say, Labbaik Allahumma Umrah. That's it. Because from the Miqat here, you're not going to make Hajj, you're going to make Umrah. And then you're going to come out of Ihram and go back in for Hajj. After that, it is legislated. The Prophet وسلم, said, Allahumma, Hadihi Hajja, La Riyaa Fiha, Wala Sum'a. Oh Allah, this is a Hajj that is being performed without any intent of showing off or seeking reputation. So in going into the state of Ihram, then one can say, you should say as the Prophet Sallallahu said, and if it's Umrah, then you say, Labbaik Allahumma. You say, Allahumma, hadihi al-Umrah, la riyaa fiha wa la sum'a. Oh Allah, this Umrah is being performed without any intention of showing off or seeking a reputation. One, one second. The third and final thing that one says when entering and assuming the ihram is that which all of you know, and that is the talbiyah. The bake along with the bake, the bake the lasharika, like a bake into the end of the talbiyah. And this is to be said all the way until the person gets to Mecca. So these are the three things that are legislated for one to say when entering into the state of al ihram. Likewise, the author did not mention something that may be well known to most of you and it's written in many of the books of, uh, that deal with the rights and that is that the majority of the scholars of Islam deem it to be sunnah to make two rakats before assuming ihram. The majority of the scholars of Islam hold this to be from the sunnah to make two rakats before entering into or before assuming ihram. And in fact, some of the scholars have mentioned that there is ijma, that is scholarly consensus, that this is something that is desirable for the one who is going to assume ihram to do. Some of the scholars like Imam you know, Ibn Jama'ah, others have mentioned that this is by consensus. However, there are other scholars that say that there is no specific two rakats for entering into Islam. In this area, there is some leeway in this area. However, if someone goes to the Miqat and they have already prayed the Salat there, for example, they pray Dur at the Miqat, or they pray Asr, or Maghrib, or Isha, then at this point, uh, it is... I'm <laughs> Absolutely. 
make, make you offer. As the brother just said, he has mental problems. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure him. Give him the best of his life. Now, tight. If a person happens to have already prayed once they get to the miqat, in other words, it is the time for the it's the time for Asr, Mother, Misha, Fajr, or whatever, don't make another, you don't need to make another two rakats for Islam. Because the Prophet did not actually perform more rakats just for Islam. He actually made Islam after the Fard Salah. So if you get to the miqat and you've already prayed, or you were praying there at the miqat, then just Assume ihram after that, once you have gotten back on the bus or the car. So these things to, to summarize, to summarize quickly and then we'll move on to the muwaqit uh, or the, the miqats. What are they? Where are they? What do they signify? To, to summarize, if you are here staying in Medina, then what I recommend is that you prepare for ihram here in Medina, in the hotel. Because it is usually extremely crowded at the Mikans and very difficult for one to comfortably prepare for Ihram. If you want to wait till you get to the Mikan to prepare, that's not a problem either. But the point is there's also no harm in doing so here for Medina. The Mikan is approximately 13 kilometers away from al masjid Nabu. 13 kilometers from here. So it's not a long time. You'll be there. You can prepare. You can prepare while you are here. So take the ghusl, apply whatever scent that you want to apply, put on the garments. When you put on the garments, that doesn't mean that you have entered into the state of ihram. It doesn't mean you have assumed the ihram, you just put on the garments, all right? Uh, likewise, so you remove all of your normal clothing. If you want to keep some of your regular clothing on until you get to the miqat and actually assume ihram, that's not a problem. There's no problem in doing so. And you are going to remove any necessary hair that you would like to remove from your body or cut your fingernails. Excluding the beard, as the author of Allah Ta'ala mentioned, that it is not permissible to take from the beard at any time, not before Islam, not during or after. Once you get to the Mikah, and the woman is going to do the same thing that the men do. Once you get to the Mikah, then you can pray there at the Mikah to Rakat. Once you get back on the bus, or you get in the car or van or whatever, whatever way you are traveling to Mecca, at that point you are going to say, La Bayt Allahumma Umrah. Allahumma hadihi al Umrah. La riya afiya wa la sum'ah. La Bayt Allahumma la Bayt. La Bayt la sharika. La kala Bayt. Is that clear? That is a summary of everything that we have taken. Uh, as for the issue of the uh, pronouncing intentions, and other than the uh, for other than ihram, and even for ihram, that is not actually pronouncing the intention. You're not saying I intend to do. You are verbalizing the rites that you are going to perform. Then we should know, as the author said, that this is something that has been invented in the religion. Not something that the Prophet ﷺ did, nor something that the companions did. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever does something that is not from this deen of ours, then it will be rejected. No matter how good the person's intentions are, even if his intentions are great, this is something that will not be accepted from him, rather it will be rejected, and perhaps we'll deal with that further uh, as the lessons go on, inshallah. al and al-Makaniyya, vocational boundaries. There are five families. One, the Khulayfa, the Miqat for the people of Medina, more famously known as Al-Ghab Ali. Two, Jufa, the Miqat for the people of Syria. It's a desolate village near Rabil. People nowadays assume that Rabil from Rabil, there is nothing wrong with, with doing so, as Rabil is very close to Jufa. Three, Qadr al-Manazir, the Miqat for the people of Najd, more famously known today as, as Sayyid. Four, Yalamlam. The Mi'kwan for the people of Yemen, five, that's up, the Mi'kwan for the people of Ramba. These boundaries were specified by the Prophet Sallallahu for the people of the respective lands, as well as for those who are going to pass by them with the intention to perform Hajj or Umrah. It is incumbent upon those who pass these boundaries on the way to make making Hajj or Umrah that they assume a from them. Hence, it is impermissible to pass 
these markets without a single farm, regardless of the regardless of the means of transportation used, whether that be an airplane. Hey, hey, we'll get to the airplane. Alhamdulillah. Here, the author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, begins a new chapter, and he's talking now about uh, what are known as al muwaqit so we call them the miqats. Okay? Miqats in uh, the Arabic language or in the Sharia is two different types. We have time-based miqat, and the word miqat in the English language can be translated loosely as boundaries. Alright, so we have these time-based boundaries, and we also have location or location-based boundaries. Alright? When we discuss the time-based boundaries, what are, we, what are we talking about? We're talking about the time when one can assume the ihram for hajj. Someone cannot come in Ramadan, for example, and say, Allah, I'm going to make a Oh, Allah, I'm going to make hajj. From the Miqat is Ramadan. You can't make hajj yet. All right? You cannot assume the ihram for hajj until Shawwal. That is the first of the months. Yani, that's the tenth month, the month after Ramadan. It's the first time that a person can actually go into the state of, or assume the state of ihram for hajj. This is a time-based boundary. The author here is discussing location-based boundaries, the miqats, all right? And he mentioned what is based on the famous hadith of Ibn Abbas, ta'ala who said that the Prophet وسلم, determined these particular locations. The Prophet Sallallahu determined Dal Hulayfa, Dul Hulayfa to be the Miqat for the people of Medina. And Al Juhfa, Wali Ahl Sham Al Juhfa, for the people of Sham, which is greater Syria. Okay, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, all of this is known as a Sham, the Levantine. Wali Ahl Sham Al Juhfa, alright, a place called Al Juhfa, we'll talk about it in a minute. Wali Ahl, Wali Ahl Najdin. And he prescribed Qat al Manazil as the Miqat for the people of Najd. Wali Ahl al Yemeni Yalamlam. And he prescribed Yalamlam as the Miqat for the people of Yemen. Then the Prophet went on to say, Hunna lahunna, Wali man ata alayhinna min ghayri ahlihinna, Iman arad al Hajja aw al Umrah. These places are for the people of the places that we have mentioned and also those who come to those places from other locations. Like all of you right now have come to Medina from a different place. And so your miqat becomes the miqat of the people of Medina. As the Prophet ﷺ prescribed the miqat for the people of Medina to be Dhul Hulayfa. فَهُنَّ لَهُنَّ وَلِمَنْ أَتَى عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَهْلِهِنَّ For anyone who wants to perform Hajj and Umrah. And so this is why the author says that based on the statement of the Prophet وسلم, that anyone who wants to perform Hajj and Umrah and then goes past one of these miqats, that is they live outside these boundaries and then they go past these boundaries then they must assume the ihram yani prior to passing the boundary. Alright? So they are five. There are five, as the author had mentioned. The first of those is Dhul Hulayfa. And that is known nowadays as Abir Ali. Alright, but the proper name is the name that the Prophet gave it, and that is Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa, which is 13 kilometers from here, in Masjid Nabawi, is, a, is the longest of the Miqat, yani distance wise, it is the furthest from Mecca. It's 420 kilometers from Mecca. The next Miqat, is Al Juhfa. Alright, and that is approximately 185 kilometers from Mecca. And it is on the, uh, it's actually on the coast, on the coast of the Red Sea, south of, of Medina. So you actually will see the signs when you're traveling on the road from uh, Medina to Mecca, you see the signs for Al Juhfa. Now the author mentioned that Juhfa is a desolate place, there's nobody there, it's been abandoned. And uh, everybody now makes it on from Raghib, which is adjacent to Al Juhfa. But that's not the case. Juhfa has been rebuilt, and the roads now actually go to Juhfa. 
Jaffa is the place, Jaffa is the miqat for anyone coming from the west as well. Not just for those coming from the northwest, like uh, Palestine or Jaffa, but anyone coming from the west. The United States, Morocco, Egypt, England, anywhere from the west, then the miqat of the people from the west is al Jaffa. And this is going to be important to, to note, especially for those coming by plane. What do they do? All right? So to know they're coming from the west, it's, it's uh, al Jaffa. For those coming from the east, next, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, or anywhere else coming from the east, like the, uh, the Gulf states, then their miqat is known as Qab al Manazim. It's approximately, it's the closest one. It's 78 kilometers from Mecca. And it's adjacent to Taif. All right? And it's known today as as -Sain. And this is where the people from the east uh, make their uh, ihram, or they assume ihram. There's also Datu Hirq, known in these days and times as al -Qaib. And it has also been rebuilt in recent times. And there is a place, there is a place where people make ihram there. This is the miqat for the people coming from the northeast like Iraq and this end. The last of the Mawaqeet or the Miqats, the fifth, is Yalamlam. This is the one to the south, approximately 120 kilometers south of Mecca. This is the Miqat for the people who are coming from the southern direction, like the direction of Yemen or inside of Saudi Arabia, Jazan and the likes. So they make uh, Ihram or they assume Ihram from Yalamlam, which is known today as Saadi. Alright, so it is impermissible, it is impermissible for anyone, and, and uh, these Muwaqeet, they form like, uh, not exactly an oval shape, but if you connect the dots of the Muwaqeet, then you see that obviously the majority of the world is coming from outside of the Muwaqeet. However, there are people that live inside of the mountains, like Jeddah, for example, is considered to be inside of the mountain and better in other places. The author is going to talk about the people who live inside of the Mawaqeet or between the Miqat and Mecca. How do they assume a or What do they do? The author is going to talk about that. However, for the majority of the people of the world who live outside of these Mawaqeet, it is impermissible to pass the Miqat if you want to make Hajj or Umrah without assuming Ihram. It is wajib. Therefore, for a person who does not assume ihram from the miqat, then they have to go back. And if they don't go back, then they have left off something that is wajib. And if you leave off something that is wajib, then you have to sacrifice a sheep or a goat or a seventh. And you have to share with someone else and share in a seventh of a camel or a cow if one does not assume ihram from the miqat. No. Hence, it is impermissible to pass these mawaqeet without assuming ihram, regardless of the means of transportation used, whether that be an airplane, a car, a bus, and etc. The proof for this is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu these boundaries are for the inhabitants of these places as well as for those who come to them intending to perform Hajj or Umrah. It is legislated for the one who is going to fly to perform Hajj or Umrah to prepare, to prepare for Ihram, take a shower, clean himself, and etc. before boarding the plane. When the airplane nears the Miqat, he should assume Ihram. And if there is time, he should make the intention for Umrah. And if there isn't, then he should suffice with the intention for Hajj by saying, what make a Hajjan. Additionally, there is nothing wrong with donning the Izzam and the Dad before boarding the plane or before approaching the Miqat. But if he does this, then he should be careful not to enter the state of Ikram. Here the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, says, as for those who are coming to the Miqat by way of plane, obviously they can't get off the plane and go to the Miqat and this is not going to happen. So what does someone do? And if you are going from Medina to Jeddah, and you're going to go to Jeddah, there's no airport in Mecca. If you're going to Mecca, 
by way of plane from Medina going to Jeddah and then to Mecca, then you need to be very alert about what it is that you're supposed to do because the miqat comes very quickly. All right? So, for those who are coming to or going towards Mecca via plane, they're not going to be stopping at any miqat. Then it is best for them to prepare for ihram before getting on the plane. Because the it's too difficult to get ready for ihram on the plane, if not impossible. It's very difficult to do so when on the plane. So once you get prepared before getting on the plane, take the ghusl, apply the scent and to the end of it. When the plane now gets close to going over the miqat, or is in line with the miqat, uh, if you are on a Muslim airline, they are going to tell you that you are close to the miqat. If you are not, uh, then chances are they won't tell you that you are close to the miqat. As soon as they tell you that the plane to get ready for landing, to put on your seatbelt and these type of things that they tell you, at this point, at this point is when you want to begin to make uh, or assume ihram and make the telling. Because at this point you will be very close to going over the miqat of Jufa or whatever direction that you are coming from. However, for those who are leaving from Medina, the miqat comes approximately two to three minutes after takeoff. It's very quick. So as soon as the plane takes off, you will hear the, the person mentioned that we are coming close to the miqat, so you can begin to assume ihram. It is perfectly fine. It is okay to assume ihram slightly before the miqat. That's not a problem. The big problem is to assume ihram after the miqat. This is a this is a major problem because now you have left off something that is wajib upon you to do. So if you make ihram five minutes before you get to the miqat or something like this or before the plane is going to go over the miqat to be in line with the miqat, then there is no harm in doing so by consensus of the scholars. The consensus of the scholars is that it is valid to make ihram before the miqat, and this was mentioned by Ibn al-Mundir in al ijmaq and likewise uh, al qurtubi in his tafsir. He should not make the intention until he's adjacent to the miqat or the period. This is because the Prophet did not make the intention for ihram except from a miqat. This is because the Prophet did not make the intention for ihram except from a miqat. Moreover, it is obligatory upon the ummah to follow the Prophet in this regard and in all other religious matters.
as Allah says, فَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a good example. Also, the Prophet ﷺ in his farewell, also the Prophet ﷺ said in his farewell, خُذُوا عَنْهِ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ Take your rights from him. So here, the author Rahimahullah Ta'ala says that it is not legislated for one to make uh, the ihram or to assume ihram before the miqat. In other words, in a great distance before the miqat. You don't make ihram as soon as you get on the plane. Uh, you don't assume ihram uh, from a distance that is very far from the miqat because this is not what the Prophet Wasallam did. And the Prophet is the best example for us as Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala said in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنٍ that you have in the message of Allah the best of examples and likewise due to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لِتَأْخُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ to take your rights from me this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed the Muslims to do so we follow the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in performing the Hajj and that starts with the uh, assumption of Iran now are there any questions? جزاكم الله خيرا وبارك الله فيكم ونفع الله بما قلتم. This person says, How old was عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم married her? The question is a question that all English speakers should be aware of the answer to and how to deal with this because it's, it, there is a and a, an ideological assault on Islam. And that question is, how old was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala in that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her? And the answer is that she was six when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her and she was nine when the marriage was consummated. And this is something that for many people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, or should I say both non-Muslim and Muslims alike, they find this to be something that is strange. That a, a man in his early 50s would marry a girl of nine years old, or consummate a marriage with a girl of nine years old. Brother Allah ta'ala and Muhammad However, the first thing we need to look at when we look at the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu to Aisha is that marriage is not an act of pure devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, what I mean by that is not a ritual act of worship. It's not like salat and zakat and uh, fasting and making hajj. Marriage is a cultural element that has been given guidelines by the sharia. Like buying and selling, for example. Buying and selling is not ibadah in and of itself. It can turn into ibadah based on a person's intentions, but in and of itself, it's not ibadah. But it, there are guidelines to buying and selling that have been established by the sharia. Likewise, marriage is a cultural act that the sharia has come and given certain guidelines to. Therefore, when we look at the marriage of anyone to anyone that had been 1,400 years ago, that we cannot judge it based on the cultural lens that we have from today. In other words, we cannot look now at a marriage that took place then and say with the, with the belief or the culture that we have today and juxtapose it on the culture that was present at the time of the Prophet and say, oh, this is something that's extremely weird. So we take a step back and look at the culture of the people at that particular time and did that seem to be something that was normal or abnormal amongst Semites in general, both the, the Jews and the, the Muslims, you know, the Arabs at that particular time, a woman was considered to be of age once she reached puberty. She was considered to be of marriageable age. Whether that was 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever age they reached the puberty, then they were considered to be marriageable. So that wasn't something that was looked at as being something strange by the people of that time. And had it been so, then that would have been the first thing that they would have said about the Prophet ﷺ because they said a bunch of other things about him. They said that he was Majnun, that he was crazy. Okay? They said that he was a, uh, a sorcerer. 
They said that he was a kahin, yani a fortune teller. They said a bunch of things about the Prophet Sallallahu They never once said that he was a pedophile. They never once said that, oh, what's wrong with him? He marries these young girls. Because it wasn't seen as something that was abnormal for the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nor at the times immediately after that because Islam had spread within the first hundred years to the east and to the west. And it made it to Morocco and then into Spain and India and China. Okay, and nobody, and this is something that was very well known, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and was a scholar of Islam. So it's not like she wasn't known. And it's not like the people didn't know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her at a young age. Had this been something that was uh, extremely abnormal or even abnormal for that matter, then it would have been the first thing that they would have used as a deterrent from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's from a cultural aspect. The other thing that we need to look at is that the Prophet Sallallahu did not have a desire to marry Aisha ta'ala as a little girl. This came to him as a dream. And dreams were from the forms of prophecy. The dreams of the prophets are true. And as it comes to Sayyid Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu saw in a dream that he was to marry Aisha ta'ala and he went to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he informed him of the dream that he had. The marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Aisha was divine, divinely inspired. And for those of you who look at the hikmah of the Prophet's marriage to Aisha, you can see this inspiration that was there. Allah promised us to protect this deen. And he protected this deen through the companions of the Messenger ﷺ who memorized the Quran, who wrote the Quran down, who spread the Quran, who recited the Quran in every one of the five salawat taught it to those who came after them and protected the Qur'an. Likewise, they protected the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which explains to us the Qur'an. They protected the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which explains to us the Qur'an. And that Sunnah is not just what the Prophet Sallallahu did in public. Anybody can go out in public and they can be someone who they are not. And they can sit in the masjid and they can stand in, in Qiyam for an hour and then sujood for 20 minutes and do all of these things and be from the worst people behind the scenes when they go to their homes. And if you ask their children and their wives about them, they would tell you a whole different story. But if you ask the wives of the Prophet them about them, what stories do we get? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is the one who narrated to us 2210 hadith of the Prophet And these are the hadith where we can verify that the Prophet ﷺ was better behind the scenes than he was even in public. He was the one who would stand as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala in her narrative. He was the one who would stand until his feet would swell. And she would say to him, aren't you the one who has been forgiven all of his previous sins and all of his, any of, any of his sins? He said, Should I not be a thankful servant to Allah? If it wasn't for the fact that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was young and outlived all of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except for Umm Salama and was a scholar of Islam in her own right and narrated to those who came after her and the generations that came after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because she didn't die until 47 or 48 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so she lived enough to be able to narrate all of these hadith and inform us that the hand of the Prophet never touched the hand of a woman who was not mahram for her. And she informed us about the night prayer of the Prophet And she informed us about the gentleness and, the, and how the kind nature of the Prophet to the end of it. We would have never known who this man, alayhi salatu wassalam, whom we love, we would have never known who he was behind the scenes, if you will, if it was not for Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So that marriage of the Prophet to Aisha is not something that the Muslims should be ashamed of or something that we should be afraid to talk about. Now, the Prophet وسلم, consummated the marriage with her at nine years old and this was from Rabbul Alameen. This is not something that he had, a desire that he had in his, own, in his own self. And we know, if you look up the definition of what a pedophile is, a pedophile is a grown person who likes to have intimate relations with children, not one child. They don't stop at one. This is a disease. And a disease doesn't stop at one or two. This is something that they have to be forced to be stopped. 
The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi only had one wife that was a virgin, period. And one that was young like Aisha, and that was her. And this is something again that was from Allah. As the Wajal that served as a means to protect and preserve this deen of Al Islam. The other thing to mention is that had Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, been the type we see today when young children are abused, sexually abused by elders, they have these problems the rest of their lives. They have problems, yani. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was a scholar. She didn't have any problems with Alhamdulillah, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 